Jesus, I'm frail. I'm so very weak. My faithfulness fails. My courage will flee. But you are my rock, my shelter and shade. When I'm burdened down. for grace and mercy anew I must have your strength oh I must have you Good morning, Grace Church. Come on in and find your seats. And we want to welcome you as well if you're joining us through the live stream and YouTube. And happy Father's Day to our fathers that are here. We are here this morning to hear from our great Heavenly Father who who loves us and knows us through the Son, Jesus Christ. This has been an exciting and weird morning for us here at Grace. Um, uh, About 20 minutes before the first service, I was sitting there at my desk. It was quiet and lightning struck and it took out, so far it took out our projector. And so uh, you have a handout there. Uh, You'll still be able to follow along on the screen if you're watching by the live stream, that'll still be uh, seen for you. But we're not sure what all else it got. It might've gotten me a little bit, I think. Uh, as I jumped out of my seat, a, a few feet at least, um, I think I became charismatic this morning. So, so uh, finally, somebody said. Um, <clears throat> anyway, we are here this morning to worship the Lord. Would you hear 
uh, God's word to us. This is a call to worship from what Jesus said in John 15. He said, Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. We celebrate the fact that the Lord, the Father of all creation, sent his Son and he laid down his life for us. Praise the Lord for that. Would you pray with me this morning? This morning, Lord, we... We come before you and we acknowledge that we are a needy people. Lord, we call on your name and we can only do that in prayer and in song and in our preaching because your son was sent for us while we were sinners and has laid down his life for us, all who know him by faith. Lord, this is a marvelous and remarkable truth and how easily our hearts grow cold to it. And so, Lord, we pray that you would stir this up in our affections, in our understanding today, and maybe for some for the very first time. Lord, we thank you for your love for your people, your churches here and all over the world. We pray that you would strengthen them. We pray that you would strengthen us in your grace and through your word We also ask, Lord, that you would strengthen our missionaries who have been sent out from here. And we pray especially this morning for the Moorhead family as they serve you faithfully in the Czech Republic. All that they do, all that they put their hands to, their their teaching, their language learning, their discipleship, their leadership in the local churches there. Father, we pray that you would undergird all their efforts and that they would all be sprinkled with a knowledge of your love and your grace. And then they would be exercised with humility and compassion and faithfulness. And we pray, Lord, for a great awakening to happen, Lord, there in the churches of the Czech Republic, and that many would come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, as so many even now are in darkness. We pray that you would use our feeble efforts in sending these missionaries, and that you would use their efforts to further the gospel for your name's sake. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Please stand and uh, we'll uh, sing through a couple songs here. Uh, because they're handouts and it was kind of last minute, they may not be exactly in the order, so I'll try to give you cues, but just kind of watch for when we move between verses and, and choruses and things like that. We're starting with Redeemed, Restored, Forgiven. far and wide, far from the cleansing fountain, far from the pierced side. But Jesus sought and found us and washed our guilt away. With cords of love he bound us to be his own soul. Oh, who can tell the story of love that made us whole? Not ours, not ours, the merit be yours alone, the praise. And ours a thankful spirit to serve you all our days. creation when 
when earth meets heaven's shore, we find our full salvation and praise you goodness and wonder and, and glories of Calvary. Lord, your call. Take me deeper into the glories of Calvary. Sinners find eternal joy in the triumph of your wounds. And by our Savior's crimson flow, holy wrath has been We've been studying the book of Hosea. We have been talking about the theme of God's love for us. And, and God's love is, is something that is very easily taken for granted. And we sometimes think of it as, 
as an obligation that he has for us, that he's just obliged to love us. And one of the ways in which God loves us, and it's not often talked about or remembered, is what we find in Hebrews chapter 12. If you'll turn there, that's our scripture reading this morning. And it is how God disciplines us so that we will understand, appreciate, and, and be, uh, be brought into his love and reminded of his love for us. On this Father's Day, we are reminded of our ultimate Heavenly Father. We have fathers in this life that some are very faithful and righteous, and some have not proven to be that. And, and yet, always, for the child of God, we have a Father who is always faithful, a God who has shown Himself to be a Father who loves us. And He does that here in Hebrews 12 through His disciplining arm. This is a hard passage, but one that we need to hear, and it complements wonderfully what we're going to see in Hosea chapter 4 a little bit later this morning. Would you follow along as I read Hebrews chapter 12, and I'll read through verse 17. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. You have not resisted to the point of shedding blood and your striving against sin, and you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by Him. For those whom the Lord loves, He disciplines, and He scourges every son whom He receives. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons." For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, as seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good, so that we may share his holiness." All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Therefore, strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble, and make straight paths for your feet, so that the limb which is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. Pursue peace with all men and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God. That no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it many be defiled. That there be no immoral or godless person like Esau, who sold his own birthright for a single mill. For you know that even afterwards, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place for repentance." though he sought for it with tears. Would you pray with me? Our Father, this passage exists because the truth is we sin, we go astray, we commit transgressions, we miss the mark, we fall short. And even in that, Lord, we can go through the motions of repentance, much like Esau and yet it be just a temporary remorse and not a true turning from sin. Even with displays of tears and anguish outwardly, yet our hearts stay cold to our sin. So Lord, we ask that you would move our hearts and shape them by your grace and remind us, reminding us again here through your word of the great work that has been done on our behalf to remove our sin, not only its penalty, but its power from us, and one day its presence. For the penalty has been removed, and we are no longer children of wrath, but we belong to you as sons and daughters, and we can call you our Father, our Abba Father. 
And the penalty has been assuaged and the wages of sin, which is death for each one of us who believe, has been turned aside and poured out on your Son, Jesus Christ. The power of sin has also been broken. And so that we are no longer slaves to our sin. Though it doesn't feel like it, Lord, we can say no to sin and we can do that because of the power of your Spirit that works within us, conforming and shaping us and equipping us and moving us to do good and to obey you from a heart that has been changed and ratified by your grace. Lord, we are hopeless and helpless without all of this. And only those who know that the penalty and power of sin has been assuaged, only those one day will be saved from the presence of sin as they dwell with you in a new heavens and a new earth under the reign of the Messiah, Jesus. Until that day, Lord, we pray that we would stand firm in the faith, that we would strengthen the hands that are weak, that we would make make straight paths for our feet that we would pursue peace with all. Lord, this too is a work of grace that we need, and yet we are responsible to to respond to your grace in love and affection, realizing and recognizing the work that you have done in us. Father, we ask that you would open our hearts and our, our eyes to understand your word today, that it would move us and shape us for better things, Better things than the sin which we so easily love and so easily entangles us. Better things like walking with Christ and being salt and light in this world for his namesake. And it is for his name that we pray. Amen. Please stand again as we we, uh, sing through the next couple songs. Uh, This first one, Christ is mine forevermore. We're speaking the truths of of Christ and who he is and, and the fact that we have him and he has us um, if we are in him um, and it is not temporal but eternal. Mine are days that God has numbered I was made to walk with Yet I look for worldly treasure and forsake the King of Kings. But mine is hope in my Redeemer. Though I fall, His love is sure. For Christ has paid for every failing. I am His forever. tears in times of sorrow darkness not yet understood through the valley I must travel where I see no earthly good but mine is peace that flows from heaven and the strength in times of need I know my pain will not be wasted. Christ completes his work in me. Mine are days here as a stranger, pilgrim on a I will encounter harm and hatred for his name. But mine is armor for this battle, strong enough to last the war. And he has said he will deliver safely to the golden shore. And mine are keys. Zion City, 
where beside the King I'll walk, for there my heart has found its treasure. Christ is mine forevermore. Christ is mine forevermore. Christ is mine forevermore. As we do still walk in this world, um, and it weighs us down, uh, the world and, and the flesh and the devil, it all is with us always. Um, we, we long for heaven, and uh, this song now, uh, Weary of Earth, Myself and Sin, is confessional in that, that we long for that and we hope for that day uh, because we will, um, we will one day rest with Christ there. set me free and to thy glory take me in for there I long to be let a poor labor here below when from his toil set free to rest in peace eternal go for there I long to Whither shall I flee? But to the arms for peace and rest, for there I long to be. Let a poor labor here be low, when from his toil set free, to rest in peace eternal go. all this world to me. May I the better world obtain, for there I long to be. Let a poor labor here be long, when from his toil set free, to rest in peace eternal go. set me free. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we praise you because uh, you can set us free and do in Christ Jesus. We hope in him and, and trust in him. And that is not something that you had to do for us, Lord. Um, you did not need to save us. You did not need to send your only son and sacrifice him for us, but you do that, and we praise you because of that. Um, that is so good and gracious uh, that you would do that, Lord. Uh, we can trust in that. Lord, in this world, we do have many troubles, and we can be tossed about, but you, Lord, are sovereign over it all. We praise you for that. We worship you because you are almighty and powerful over the winds and the waves, the times and the seasons, um, over uh, rulers and authorities, Lord. You are sovereign over that all. Uh, you are sovereign over our hearts, our sinful hearts, and you are compassionate to us. And we praise you and thank you for that. Lord, we worship you today because of what you have done through your son, Jesus Christ. Um, again, that is completely undeserved by us, but you do that. And so let us cling to that today uh, as, we, as we praise you and worship you and come to a time now of worshiping you through 
uh, teaching and learning. Uh, help us, Lord, to have hearts that are tuned to hear what you have to say to us, that they, they would not be, our ears would not be stopped up and our hearts would not be hard, but let us be soft uh, in our hearts and minds to hear what you have to say. We praise you and thank you for your great love and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Let's take our Bibles this morning. We're in Hosea chapter 4. Hosea chapter 4. We've been studying the book of Hosea, and it's about the love of God, and we're looking at it from a number of dimensions, and we get to chapter 4, and there's something missing, the love of God. It, it's not mentioned. It, it's, it's absent, or so it seems. And we ask, where is the love? It's, it's not here, and, and, and yet it is. And, and we need to see this from the, the aspect of, of God's goodness to his people and his faithfulness. Um, Hosea chapter 4 is a dark chapter, and this goes along with a, a few dark chapters in Hosea. And In fact, Hosea 4 and chapter 5 are, are not going to be uh, exactly cheery and, and light, and, and we're going to be looking for just any sounds of good news, any glimmers of hope. And, and in chapter 4, at least, it's not there. It, it, it just ends on a, on a very dark note. And there's a reason for this, and that is because of who God is addressing at that time and, and where the nation of Israel was in its disobedience. Some of you uh, whippersnappers, you'll know this name, Alexander Solzhenitsyn. He was a, he was a uh, Russian-born writer and was imprisoned by the Soviet Union uh, back during the times of communism and later released and and uh, went on to write and speak and even came to the United States and spoke here and spoke um, at, a long time ago at Harvard's commencement address. And uh, that would not be done today. And one of the things that he said, he was a believer. He, he spoke in his speech on May 10th, 1983. He, he said, and he was reflecting and reminiscing on why are things the way they are in Russia, Soviet Union at the time. And we could ask the same question today. Why are things the way they are today in our culture and not only here, but in the, around the world? And he said more than, uh, he said this on May 10th, 1983, more than a half century ago, while I was still a child, I recall hearing a number of older people offer the following explanation for the great disasters that had been befallen Russia. Men have forgotten God. That's why all this has happened, they told him. He reflects on that and he says, what is more, the events of the Russian Revolution can only be understood now, at that time, at the end of the 20th century, against the background of what has since occurred in the rest of the world. In other words, what he's seeing happen there is not only true there, it's happened everywhere. And what emerges here, he says, is a process of universal significance. And if I were called upon to briefly Identify briefly the principal trait of the entire 20th century, we would add 21st century so far in this fifth of it. Here too, he says, I would be unable to find anything more precise and pithy than to repeat once again, men have forgotten God. Still true. Men have forgotten the Lord. The history of mankind since the fall is, is, a, is a history of that. that. That is how our Bibles read. Everything's wonderful. Everything's beautiful. Everything is good in the opening chapters. And then chapter three hits. And it's never the same until you get to the last two and a half chapters of Revelation. Never all put back together just so. And, and we are in the middle of all of that. <clears throat> And what Solzhenitsyn said about Russia is what Hosea says here about Israel. It could also be said about our generation as well. Men have forgotten God. And Hosea chapter 4, is, it's a hard chapter. In fact, as I said, the next few chapters are going to be what we might call some, <clears throat> some dark reading. Words of comfort will be hard to come by. One person has said that Hosea is the, the deathbed prophet to the nation Israel. What imagery, right? 
They're, they're on their deathbed. There is nothing left to do. And here comes God's prophet Hosea, and he swoops in, and, and here he delivers this final message in his prophecy, Hosea. Chapter 4, is, it, it reads like a court proceeding. You've, you've seen court scenes on television and movies or in John Grisham novels, or maybe you've been to court recently for whatever reason. Uh, and, and it reads that way. In, in, in chapter 4 is, is, a, is a courtroom proceeding where charges are being read against the one who is being prosecuted. In this context, it's Israel. It's been called... God's arraignment of his people. And, and here are the charges against Israel. They're, they're being detailed and read in God's court. And Hosea is much like the book of Revelation. If we think about the book of Revelation, we think of those last few chapters, starting in chapter 20 through tra- chapter 22. It's wonderful. It's good. Uh, he wipes away every tear from our eyes. There's no death. There's no sin. There's no pain. There's no suffering. There's no rioting. There's no protesting. There's no looting. There's nothing except one people of many tribes and tongues and ethnicities all gathered around the throne of the Lord Jesus Christ, worshiping him forever. That's the end of the story. How do you get to that? Well, to get to that, the one who is on that eternal throne must lay down his life for a people, and yet even in his laying down a life, uh, his life for his people, He causes people to take up their cross and follow him. And so what comes before Revelation 20 through 22 is judgment. It's hard words, first to the church in Revelation 1 through 3. And then in chapter 6 through 19, he pours out his judgment on the earth because of Israel. And it is tribulation like the world has never seen. I'm mentioning that because Hosea is very similar to that. The end of Hosea is wonderful. It's rich. It, it ends on a, on a high note. You see that language. At the end of Hosea, in chapter 14, it says, Israel will blossom like a vine. It's like the end of Revelation. But first, there's some hard words here to unpack. Like Jesus unpacked some hard words to the churches there that are mentioned in the opening chapters of Revelation. There's some hard words here. God deals with his people. And what we see in both of those instances, in Revelation and in Hosea, what we see in both is that he disciplines those whom he loves. The language of this chapter is sharply worded. It's it's meant to be a a sobering slap to, to Israel's idolatrous face. It's painful. If we imagine a a courtroom scene, which is how this is taking place, here in Hosea 4, there there are five charges that are read. Five charges. It's actually five paragraphs here in in this chapter. Five charges that are read, and, and as we read these again, we're not in that original context, but as we read them for our prophet, they are meant to test our own understanding, appreciation, and appropriation of the of God's merciful love. As these charges are are read against Israel, we must ask a question. Could this be true of me also? As as God begins to to kind of weed through the straw pile and he puts his finger on some things, could we ask a question, not of our neighbor, not of the world, but of our own hearts, could this be true of me? We need to keep in mind as we read through chapter 4 here and we study this together that God is writing this, listen, to his chosen covenant people. This is not whatever image of your enemy you might have, of somebody who is lost in their sins, who is out in the world and all of those things. This is someone, this is a, a people who supposedly know the Lord and walk with him and have been marked and called by him in his grace. And he has strong words for them. He has strong words for us, and we need to hear it. Hosea 4 and chapters like it, they're in your Bible so that we will learn to truly hate sin and also perceive the horrible offense that sin is to our holy God. So here's the scene. The courtroom's packed. 
Um, the jury is seated. The judge has come out of his chambers. He's sitting there before the court. And the prosecuting attorney comes in. His name is Hosea. And he begins to read charges. And there's five of them, of them here in this chapter. And the first one is this. You have rejected the love of God. You've rejected the love of God. We see this in verses 1 through 3. Look at verse 1 here as we begin. Listen to the word of the Lord. Listen to the word of Yahweh, O sons of Israel. For Yahweh has a case against the inhabitants of the land because there is no faithfulness or kindness or knowledge of God in the land. This is the, the leading verse of the whole chapter. If, if you just understand verse 1, you'll understand everything else here in this, in this chapter. This, is, this tells us the story in, in micro form here. Now, when we read that out loud, and if you were an Israelite, one of the sons of Israel, if you heard Hosea deliver this for the first time, or you heard it read again later in the synagogues, you would have heard it this way. Instead of listen to Yahweh, you would have heard Shema as the first word. Does that sound familiar? It's a word that some of you might know. It's a word that's very significant in Israel's history. Listen, hear, Shema the Lord. Most significantly, you've probably heard that associated with Deuteronomy 6 verse 4. That's the John 3 16 of the Old Testament. Hear, O Israel, Shema, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. This is how it begins. Will you listen? Will you hear what the Lord says? He addresses the sons of Israel here. It, it, chapter 5 begins the same way. Same word again over in chapter 5. We'll see that next week. There he begins to expand his grievances. Again, not only the house of Israel, but the kings and the judges. Everybody gets lumped in in chapter 5. But here he's dealing with his people. And he says, will you listen? Over a thousand times. Over a thousand times in the Old Testament that word is used. Shema, will you listen? And it's not just a question, will you listen? It's actually an imperatival force. It's a command. You need to listen. You must listen. Listen to this. Hear this. Open your ears. Receive what is here with a pliable heart. He says, listen carefully, Yahweh has a case against Israel. Specifically, we can ask the question this way, how has Israel rejected God's love? We, we've been rehearsing that for three chapters up to this point, and we've seen it wonderfully and sadly and in a difficult way depicted in the real-life marriage of Hosea and Gomer. And that God loves his people and has pursued his people in mercy and grace and love in the same way Hosea was to pursue his his adulterous wife. But how have they rejected God's love? By the way, we'll never hear from Hosea and Gomer specifically again. Chapter 4 begins a whole new section, and it'll take us through the end. That, that connection, that story was made at the end of chapter 3, and, and the Lord is done with that. Now he turns to the, the main item of business, how Israel has rejected this love, this wooing, pursuing love that God has for his people. Well, well how have they done that? Well, a sampling of evidence has now entered into the, the court record here, and it's given in verse 1. He says three things here. There's no faithfulness, there's no kindness, or knowledge of God in the land. Now, something that doesn't always come across in our translations where he says there is no or there is not, that's actually repeated three times in the original for emphasis. There is no faithfulness. There is no kindness. There is no God, knowledge of God in the land. It implies here not merely a deficiency. You know, we really struggle with our love for God. He's not saying that. We really struggle to obey. He's not saying that. He's not saying there's a deficiency. Yeah, I could, I could work on these areas of sin more. No, he's not saying that. He, he's saying there's not just a deficiency, that these things are non-existent. That's shocking. That's what he means when he says there is no, there is not. It does not exist. 
And these attributes here in verse 1 are the attributes of the inner spiritual life. And he says they're not present. What are they? Well, look again at verse 1. The first one is faithfulness or truth. This comes from the word group, amen. When we say amen at the end of a prayer, or you, you remember Jesus saying in our study of the Gospel of Mark, truly, truly, I say to you, amen, amen. It, it is the same word group, though in Hebrew here, he's saying there is no truth, agreement with the truth. There's no faithfulness in that sense. So he's not talking about just a faithfulness to complete tasks. He's talking about a faithfulness, a fidelity to the word and the works of God. There's no truth. As Israel, as the other party in the covenant, Israel lacks any and all commitment. It's just been a one-sided agreement. God has wonderfully expressed his love for his people, and yet they just stand there cold-hearted. This is an unfaithful person at the individual level. It's one who never stands in biblical truth. They're milk toast when it comes to conviction. They, they float with the winds of change. They are carried along by their own mobs. They, they don't articulate biblical convictions. They, they can never be pinned down on anything of eternal importance. And this always shows up all over their life as they may be committed in theory to all manner of causes and concerns, but they always lack a faithful follow-through with righteousness. What is, what is truth? What is this truth that's being described here? It is a, what is being described is a transformative conviction that begins inwardly and then it shapes outwardly how you live and respond. It begins in the heart. So truth is not something we obtain outwardly or something that we just fill the coffers of our minds with. That's, that's very easy to do, by the way. The Pharisees were world-class experts at that, right? So that's not what he's talking about here. We're not talking about just filling our minds with facts and knowledge unless those facts and knowledge lead to a life of transformation. It's transformative truth is what is being described here. It's transformative convictions that begin inwardly and then they shape outwardly the person's life. There's a great example of this where the same word is used. You remember David's confession of his sin in Psalm 51, verse 6. Same word is used there. Behold, you, Lord, desire truth in the innermost being. So that's where the place of real transformation takes place. It doesn't take place, you need to understand this, in a works gospel, which is no gospel at all. It doesn't take place in just cleaning up your life. It takes place in the innermost being where God is doing the work of sanctifying and change and equipping. That's where it takes place. You desire truth in the innermost being and in the hidden part you will make me know wisdom, David says. Another one of these attributes that are here, he says it's not present at all, not only faithfulness or truth, he says kindness or a better translation, the ESV says steadfast love. This is another word, another Hebrew word. I promise I'm not going to give a Hebrew exam today, but these are some words that you might know. You might have heard the word chesed. You might have heard of Hasidic Jews. When we lived in Los Angeles, in West Los Angeles, down around UCLA, there's a, an entire Hasidic population of Jews. Downtown Mexico City, uh, obviously in certain portions of Israel, in New York, and, and all over, there are these, these small groups of Hasidic Jews. And not only are they orthodox in their beliefs, but they believe they are the truly faithful. They are the steadfast ones. They are the ones who are loyal to the covenant, they believe. You would see them with their curls and their dark dress and their black hats and their long beards and, and their rigorous attention to those things. That's not what he's talking about here. That is a misunderstanding of what it means to be chesed. What is going on here, this steadfast love is a response of lasting faithfulness and loyal love. The, it is the obligation to respond with covenant fidelity, like a marriage. We've done a lot of weddings right here on this spot. 
I don't think anyone's ever been to a wedding here at least where vows are exchanged or where the vows are read by the minister that only one party gives the vows. You hopefully have not been to a wedding like that where maybe the the husband commits vows and the wife just stands there in stone silence. Or maybe the wife gives her vows and the husband just looks at her and doesn't say anything. That'd be weird, wouldn't it? It's meant to be. That's exactly what's happening right here. The Lord says, I will love you. I am committed to you. I will save you. I will take you as my own. I will pursue you. I will love you to the ends of the earth. Even though you're awash in sin, we saw this in chapter 3, I'm going to bring you back. I'm going to rescue you. I'm going to restore you. In Israel, he says, just stands there stone silent. He says, in a matter-of-fact way, Israel is missing the love that proves faithful towards its intended object, the Lord. Persevering, loyal love are nowhere to be found. What causes this? Uh, to get to some of the causes of this, it's, a, it's sin. It's a stone-heartedness. It's amazing what Israel is walking away from in this moment, isn't it? If you think about it this way, Richard Caldwell says, it's amazing what people will throw away in their sin. The ease with which people will devalue relationships and discard them. How easily, how easily we cater to our sin and spurn the love of God. Without truth, without love, he says something is, is unavoidably absent. And the third attribute here, we're spending more time here in verse 1. I promise it won't all be this way. But he says the third thing here, there is no knowledge of God. So what, what does a lack of love and a lack of truth result in? That, that is, the, that is the, the orb in which this flows. He says the ultimate expression of that is you have no knowledge of God. It just means discernment and understanding. You don't understand who God is. And so you see here, truth and love go together to form a complete picture of the knowledge of God. Truth is the inner conviction. We might think of it this way. Look at it, verse 1. Truth is that inner conviction, we said, and love is the outward expression, and both must be present. You know what you have if you just have truth and inner convictions? You have dead theologians. What do you have if you're just led around by emotional whims and just a, an untapped love or something that you might call love? You have a love that is not tethered in truth and therefore unable to recognize the truth of God and his expressions of love for his people. That will also mean that you will not love people the way God has loved us. They go together. So truth and love go together and they, com- they form this complete picture of the knowledge of God. There's no knowledge of God in the land. This is a a significant theme. This is a significant teaching, especially in the prophets. And and they do not have soft words for Israel and Judah in this. In fact, some stronger words. Jeremiah 4, verse 22. Listen to what he says. For my people are foolish. They know me not. They are stupid children and have no understanding. They are shrewd to do evil, but to do good they do not know. Parents, you can explain that to your children later, how that is understood here. Strong words. It's, it's like, a, he says, Israel's behaving like a naive child who doesn't know his right from his left. What changes this? Well, it's to know the Lord. Proverbs 9, 10 said, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. We read Hebrews earlier. Hebrews 4, 2 says about Israel, it says, The word they heard did not profit them because it was, uni- it was not united by faith in those who heard. Does that move you at all? Does that stir up anything in you? That that is written about Israel for the church, Hebrews 4, 2. The word they heard did not profit them. 
How many sermons have we collectively heard, not only from this pulpit, but through all the audio options that are available to us and the books and the resources that have been available and have been lavished on the church of our day, how many of those things have we heard and heard? And yet Hebrews 4.2, the word they heard did not profit them because it was not united in faith by those who heard. That is a strong message to us. And he says here that is the result of not wedding together truth and love. And so it results in a lack of knowledge of God. Now, this is not just kicking around some ideas that we say, you know what, he's making some good points, I'll consider that later. Here's what you need to understand in Hosea 4. Because verse 1 is true, the result, follow the the cause and effect here, follow the effect of this now in verse 2. Ideas have consequences, and this is where we see the internal heart problems of the people are played out here. He says, as a result, verse 2, there is swearing, deception, murder, stealing, and adultery. By the way, that's just a, a smattering there, but a pretty good summary of Exodus 20 and the Ten Commandments, especially as they relate from human to human, from person to person, in our interactions with one another. There is a, a taking of oaths. There is a swearing about, about the Lord. There is deception. There is murder and hatred, it's stirring up strife. There is stealing and thievery. There is adulteries. Jesus would take all of that even further in the Sermon on the Mount and would apply some of those even to the heart level and say, not just doing those things outwardly, but even entertaining the thought in your affections is the same as far as sin. He says at the end of verse 2, they employ violence so that bloodshed follows bloodshed. Literally, it says there that blood touches blood. It's a violent culture. It's a violent people. We are talking about Russia earlier. I've been to Russia many times and And there is a difference that is there if you are not accustomed to it as soon as you get there that you you pick up on and you can't always put your finger on it. And and it is a a culture that has been raised to, to not value and love life. Now, it's very easy for an American to go in that situation and see those problems very clearly. And then they come here and I've had them stay in my home and they say, we see the same thing here. And they're right. Bloodshed follows bloodshed. A devaluing of life. We have seen that played out in all manner of forms in our culture. When there is no truth, when there is no covenant faithfulness, when there is no knowledge of God, this is the result. Understand this. It's it's not because men just love violence or they love murder and stealing. It is because there is something in the heart that is wrong. It is amiss. This is the inevitable moral decay that sets into people. Verse 2 is the result of verse 1. Because of rejection of the knowledge of God, their hearts exploded with a panoply of, of tangible expressions of sin. It goes like this, unsound doctrine leads to an unsound life. A people, a church that downplays biblical truth will result in a diminished, impoverished spiritual life. Another result, verse 3, Therefore the land mourns, and everyone who lives in it languishes along with the beasts of the field and the birds of the sky, and also the fish of the sea disappear. He's saying something that we're going to see more details on in coming chapters, but Assyria is about to overtake Israel to the north, and they're going to destroy them. Their people are going to be exiled, and there is going to be a rash on the land that will not be mitigated. And that is just a taste of ultimately what will take place as well on this earth. You don't have to be a a scientist to understand that there is something wrong with our planet. Not just the people on it, but the planet itself, right? It, It convulses, it storms, it rages. Animals kill one another and they kill people and all manner of things are going on. 
Our Bibles tell us why this is, because in Romans 3, not only did the fall of Adam in Romans, uh, Romans 5 and Genesis 3, not only did the fall of Adam plunge humanity into sin as our head and as our representative, but it also plunged the entire creation into that. And so it bears the marks of fallenness. Paul says in Romans 8, verse 19, For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God, for the creation was subjected to futility. Isaiah 24 looks to that time. It complements Revelation 6 through 19. It's often called, Revelation 20, or Isaiah 24 is often called the little apocalypse. It's a short, condensed uh, look at that. And he looks to that time, which verse 3 is just a foretaste, and he says, The earth mourns and withers, the world fades and withers, the exalted people of the earth, they fade away. The earth is also polluted by its inhabitants, for they transgressed laws, violated statutes, broke the everlasting covenant. You see, all that's related to the obedience of the people. Therefore, a curse devours the earth, and those who live in it are held guilty. Therefore, the inhabitants of the earth are burned and few men are left. That is a glimpse of the future. What's happening here in these opening verses, this salvo here, it is God's overtures of love have been rejected. His merciful compassion has been spurned and the knowledge of his goodness has been eradicated from the land. Well, that's the long point. And that's the most important point of this chapter. And let me give you four more in very quick like fashion here. Here's here's the other reading of the charges. And these other four all flow out of the first one. The first one being the head of these, the introduction. The second, you spurned the word of God. You spurned the word of God. He says it there in verse 4. This is, we'll look here at verses 4 through 6. Yet let no one find fault, let none offer reproof, for your people are like those who contend with the priest. Now what's starting to take place in verses 4 through 6 is God begins to put his finger on a particular subset in Israel, and it is the priests. The priests who are responsible for leading God's people, for declaring the word, for announcing to them, listen to this, day after day, year after year, God has spoken Not only has he spoken, he has covered your sins. And every time we sacrifice these lambs and goats, and we do it on Passover and other feasts, this is a reminder to you that God has passed over your sin. And he has done that with the blood of a lamb. And we wait for one who will come, and his name is Messiah. And he is coming, and he is going to save his people from their sins. And the prophets were preaching that again and again. And that was the message that was to be heard from the voice of the priests. And yet, they're not saying that. Instead, you know what the priests of Israel were saying? They were preaching your best life now. True. They were saying, yeah, do, do what you want to do. Go, go pursue your own thing. Yeah, you want to mix the, the worship of Yahweh with the, the, the gods of Baal? Have at it. In fact, we'll join you in that. And that's what the priests were doing. Just like false teachers today, they joined in with that. That's what's happening in verses 4 through 6. And so here God is contending with the failure of his people, but he's tracing it back to the leadership in a sense. And they spurn the word of God. Ultimately, that's what's going on here. What was the role of a priest? Malachi 2 verse 7 says positively, For the lips of a priest should preserve knowledge, and men should seek instruction from his mouth, for he is the messenger of Yahweh of hosts. Malachi says that's what should have happened, but that's not what was happening. To not listen to the priest who was given by God. We do not have priests today. I'm not a priest. We're not a high priest But those priests that were given uniquely to Israel, they they had an important function. And to spurn the priest and his message, if speaking from the Lord, was to spurn the word of God. Deuteronomy 17 verse 12 says, The man who acts presumptuously by not listening to the priest who stands there to serve Yahweh your God, nor to judge, nor to the judge, that man shall die, thus you shall purge the evil from Israel. Pretty strong words. You know what he just said, in case you missed it? If you spurn the word of God, there is a death sentence on you. 
You understand that? Now, you might say, and you're, you would be right in one part, well, that was written to Israel, and that's true. But here's how that's expanded. The wages of all sin is death. There's a death sentence on all who are without Christ. He says, verse 5, as they spurn the word of God, you will stumble by day, and the prophet also will stumble with you by night. They're just all in cahoots together. I, he says something really odd here. At the end of verse 5, he says, I will destroy your mother. Note that. It's not nice. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. You see that theme coming out again? Because you have rejected knowledge, I also will reject you from being my priests. Since you have forgotten the law of your God, and then he says, I will also forget your children. Now what's going on here? Why is he going to destroy my mother and forget my children if I'm a priest? What's happening? It's not very nice on Father's Day. He's saying something really staggering for Israel. The priests in Israel had a lineage. They, they, it was passed down. It was uh, passed down by a particular family, right? The Levitical priesthood, the Aaronic priesthood passed down through a particular line. And, and they did not even have their own tribe in a sense. They did not have their own portions of the land. They had a specific function for Israel. And it was passed down from family to family and from ma male to male. And they had a particular calling on them that was specified by the Lord and His law. And He says this, that lineage, it'll be forgotten and there'll be none after you. So that lineage, I will destroy your mother, it'll be as if she never existed. And then the priesthood, he says, will come to an end. I will forget your children. That's what he says. My friends, guess what happened? The true priesthood in Israel came to an end. In fact, it cannot even be practiced as it was decreed to be practiced by the law of the Lord because there is no temple in Israel. And many other things. From our standpoint, we know that it's come to an end primarily because Jesus, the great high priest, has come. And now there are no other high priests. There is no other go-between. You have an advocate with the Father. You have a great high priest. You do not need to go to a priest or anyone else. You have it in Christ Jesus. So those priests who should be teaching God's truth are not, so his reproof is directed towards them. A third charge is announced. You followed the leaders of corruption. So now that's made its way into the people. This follows on the last point. You followed the leaders of corruption. Uh, Israel had corrupt leaders, corrupt priests, corrupt, corrupt kings. Just read First and Second Kings, First and Second Samuel. You'll, you'll see the corruption that is so embedded in the nation. It's a corruption of the heart. Verse 7, the more they multiply, the more they sinned against me. I will change their glory into shame. The, the, just because you have more priests and more people, and you just say, well, we're just going to make more of ourselves, and it's not going to make it better. All you're doing, he says here in verse 7, for Israel to grow and not change at the heart level is just to grow in their sin. We'll populate the earth with, with more children of believers. You're just going to populate the earth with more sinners. And in fact, the glory of the priest is going to be turned to shame. The glory of the people is going to be turned to shame. It's going to be turned on its head. Look what the priests do in verse 8. They feed on the sin of my people and direct their desire toward their iniquity. That's the leaders who are charged with delivering the message of the good news to the people. God has covered your sin. God has dealt with your sin. He, they are to deliver that message. Instead, what do they do? They feed on the sins of the people. They exploit it. Imagine a hypothetical here. Imagine a priest exploiting the sins of the people. How might he do that? He, he might charge them for them to confess their sins to him. They might have to hypothetically, enter into a booth where they have to make sure they're remembering all their sins. Or they might say, enough with that system, and they've thrown it off in protest, and instead, instead of doing that, they, they, they come into a church building like this, and they think that this will absolve them of their sins. And those leaders exploit that. They feed on the sins of my people. 
What happens? They follow the leaders of corruption. Verse 9, it will be like people, like priests. So I will punish them for their ways and repay them for their deeds. A corrupt leadership will breed a corrupt following. It's been said that people get the leaders they deserve. We're seeing that played out in a million ways around the globe, in our country, in a thousand ways. People get the leaders they deserve. Well, what do they want? Well, they wanted to follow after their own idols. They wanted to follow after their own gods. Sadly, at the very end of his life, the Apostle Paul, he's, he's on his deathbed. He knows he's about to experience execution at the hands of Nero, a corrupt leader whom he's told the people to, to, to submit to. It's, it's crazy. And yet he says that the need of the people is ultimately this. It is to hear the word of God. It is to give attention to the preaching of the word and to have your heart and life conform to that. And he says in 2 Timothy 4, verse 3, one of the last things he ever says, a time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires. And they will turn away their ears from the truth and they will turn aside to miss. People will accumulate teachers that tell them what they want to hear. I would say it this way, that is more common than the opposite today. That is the norm today. That is the standard. And that's a hard word. And what happens is they, Paul says, they turn their ears away from the truth and they turn aside to myths. They, they start to believe all sorts of things. They replace the truth of God with hollow philosophies and ideas and pursuits. Or maybe even just at a personal level, they begin to, to fill that void with all manner of things. Food, drink, pleasures. He says, verse 10, they will eat but not have enough. They will play the harlot but not increase because they have stopped giving heed to Yahweh. They'll never be satisfied. They follow these leaders and how sadly it happened with the priests in Israel. It happens in many so-called churches today because they follow leaders of corruptions. corruption. Verse 10, they go away hungry. They go away with their soul's parts. Go away not having heard good news. Number four, the fourth charge, you pursued the pleasures of idolatry. A lot of repetition here in verses 11 through 14. Harlotry, wine, new wine. They take away the understanding. He says, so they've turned away from truth. Now they're just inebriated. They're self-medicating. They're, they're trying to just drown their sorrows, as it's been said. Not only that, some do that. Others may turn to all forms of idolatry. Verse 12, my people consult their wooden idol. Their diviner's wand informs them for a spirit of harlotry has led them astray and they have played the harlot departing from their God. Can you imagine that? How silly is it to worship a carved image? Isn't that ridiculous? Imagine putting that much time and attention and focus and life, and pursuits, and money into something that cannot save. I mean, imagine doing that. Aren't you glad that we're not like them? Aren't you glad that none of us do that today? It just keeps building. Obviously, we're speaking tongue-in-cheek here, that an idol does not have to be a little carved image because we carve them in our hearts. They offer sacrifices on the top of mountains and burn incense on the hills under the oak and poplar and terebinth because their shade is pleasant. What's being described here? And also in verse 13, your daughters play the harlot, your brides commit adultery. What's being described here is the actual playing out of their idolatry with the gods of Baal. I don't need to describe or expound on what's happening here in all of its darkness. 
And so the result of this, verse 14, I will, and hear this, this is strange, I will not punish your daughters when they play the harlot or your brides when they commit adultery, for the men themselves go apart with harlots and offer sacrifices and temple prostitutes. So the people without understanding are ruined. What's happening here in verse 14? Is he saying some get off free and others are being judged? Is that what he's saying? Verse 14 is a difficult verse, but I think what's happening here is that he's saying there's enough sin to go around for everybody. And when you shake your head at all of those temple prostitutes and say, how could they be with all those men? Remember that the other side of that equation is all those men. That's what he says here in verse 14. And there's equal culpability across the board in all of their idolatries and their celebrations of that. It is one thing to get tripped up by an idol. It's another thing to, after tripping up, it, uh, picking it back up and extolling it and worshiping it and celebrating it. Finally, it all ends with the fifth charge that is read. So as the first one was the ultimate head of all of this, it all devolves into this final one. Ultimately, verses 15 through 19, you despised the name of God. You despised the name of God. Verse 15, this is a little bit interesting history going on here. He says, though you... Israel, play the harlot. Do not let Judah become guilty. Also, do not go to Gilgal or up to Beth-Avon and take the oath as the Lord lives. A lot going on here. Israel, in your, in your harlotries, in your idolatry, he, he says, by the way, Judah, don't do that. <laughs> Judah, at this point, and if you blink, you'll miss it for just a small piece of history, is not culpable in what Israel is doing. But hang on, that'll eventually happen too. And so it's going to turn to judgments against Judah too. But right now, that's not the case. Judah, don't become guilty. Don't fall into their trap. And he says, don't do to go to Gilgal and Beth-Avon and take this oath. Now, now, what's going on here? This is a little bit of a, a background. When, when King Solomon died, the great King Solomon, the wisest man that ever lived, when he died, the kingdom of Israel split in two, right? Rehoboam controlled the south while Jeroboam controlled the north. And Jeroboam in the north didn't want worshiping Jews to go down to Jerusalem and, and worship and do the sacrifices at the temple as was required by the law. Because if they did that, think about this, if his people left his kingdom and they all go down there, they might not come back. And he'll lose power. That's what was happening. He would be weakened. And so what he did was he set up rival shrines at Bethel and Gilgal. And both of these became centers of idolatry in very quick-like fashion. Now, what's interesting is that the Lord does not refer to these as Bethel and Gilgal. He refers to them as Beth-Avon and Gilgal. If you go and look up in a Bible atlas, you will not find Beth-Avon there. It doesn't exist. What the Lord is doing, he, he's, he's using a, a play on words here. Instead of Bethel, the house of God, he was calling it Beth-Avon, the house of nothingness the house of disaster, the house of vanity, the house of idols. It's, it's like if you were to say, we're going out to Los Angeles or Los Diablos. It's to, to change it just ever so slightly, but the meanings are changed entirely. So what is God saying to Judah? He's saying to them, be separate, not from the world. She was to be a witness to the world of the Messiah, but to be separate from this idolatry. And what they were doing in verse 15, they were going up and they were making oaths as they're worshiping idols to God. Verse 16, since Israel is stubborn like a stubborn heifer, can the Lord now pasture them like a lamb in a large field? They, they are like trying to, to lead a stubborn cow rather than being led as a pliable sheep by the one shepherd. 
And he says, verse 17, Ephraim is joined to idols. Let him alone. Just leave him to his own devices. Now, why does he single out Ephraim? There's 10 tribes to the north. Why Ephraim? It was the largest of those 10 tribes to the north. And often Israel is just subsumed under the title of Ephraim. That's what happens here. In fact, 36 times in Hosea, he refers to Ephraim as a stand-in for all of Israel. Verse 18, their liquor gone, they play the harlot continually, their rulers dearly love shame. And so the wind wraps them in its wings and they will be ashamed because of their sacrifices. That's the end. I told you, no happy ending. No good news. It, it leaves you just kind of, we just dropped you have this wonderful, beautiful flight over North America, and then you land, and you think, you look out the window, and you see we're, we're still a couple thousand feet up, and then two seconds later, drop. What happened? Israel's sin is being exposed. God has committed his love to his people. And we should not be surprised when men... And women, boys and girls, forget God and rage against God and deny the existence of God in all manner of ways. Acting sinfully is what fallen people do. And the gospel of Jesus Christ is what fallen people need. We won't go there now, but read sometime this afternoon Ephesians chapter 2 and remind yourself of how we were present, in a sense, here in chapter 4, but God, rich in mercy, has saved us while we were yet sinners. We were dead. Everyone who is in Christ now were dead in their trespasses and sins, but have been made alive by the work of Jesus Christ, not by our works, which we have done, but by His finished work on the cross, issuing in His, His death, burial, and resurrection. That, my friends, is the good news. And here's the truth, that everyone who is not enshrouded and clothed in that good news is right here in chapter 4, without hope. So turn to Christ. Church, walk in this. When you read hard passages like this, you need to see them as correctives of a perfect father who knows everything and is telling you this out of eternal love. If your heart has been convicted in this as one of his children, do not take lightly the chastening of the Lord. Listen to what the loving father has said to us through his prophet Hosea. Would you pray with me? Father, these are hard passages and we ask for grace in this. They sting us, they come at us quickly, and they are hard to swallow. And yet this is your word, and so we do not want to despise or spurn or turn aside from it, but we pray that our hearts would be molded, shaped, and renewed in it. Father, your grace is needed in this, in the grace of Christ Jesus. We thank you for his sacrifice, for his life, for his obedience in our place, and for his coming again. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand with us as we close with one last song, truly uh, reflecting on uh, the hope that is found nowhere else but only in Christ Jesus.
His mercy makes my ransomed heart to sing. Holy, holy is the chorus rising up from those who see Christ exalted, bright and burning, full of power and purity. Where else can I go? So good to be with the people of God today, and I pray that this day will be an encouragement to you. And there's a lot going on, and well, I used to say a lot. There's a number of things going on, not as much as used to, uh, here at Grace. And we've got coming up in July, July 12th, mark that on your calendars, we'll have a baptism service that evening. It'll be a, an entire evening service just dedicated to hearing uh, folks come through the waters of baptism and sharing their testimonies. It's just an enriching and encouraging time. That'll be July 12th at 5 p.m. We've got a number of folks that will be participating in that. Also, the, the youth will be meeting tomorrow afternoon. The young men are not meeting today as they usually do. They'll be meeting tomorrow. Uh, the, the young men and women will be meeting together here at the church from 6 to 9 p.m. They'll be watching the movie American Gospel Part 2. Uh, they've watched the first part before. They'll be doing that tomorrow evening. Uh, an email went out about that. If you have any questions about that, you can see me. I don't know if Josh is still here uh, or you can see Skyler. Uh, also tomorrow, you'll be receiving uh, email, uh, a letter from the elders. We don't do this a lot. In fact, I don't know that we've ever done this uh, at this level. Uh, but we, want, we wanted to just communicate our heart on a number of things that are going on. And as we've been thinking through issues that are affecting us as a people, as a culture, uh, we, we believe there is a need for some biblical wisdom uh, in that and how we navigate some of these things that are going on, how we respond on social media, how we love one another. Uh, we feel like uh, there's some more instruction. Typically, we would do that through Grace Life and meetings and have elder Q&As, and we can't do all of that right now. And so we wanted to ex express this in this way. We hope to have a possibly an elder panel discussion. We might uh, live stream that here soon and talk through some of those things. But be looking for that. That'll go out tomorrow. And if you have any questions about that, you can see any of the elders. We'll be glad to, to help you with that. Well, let's stand together as we dismiss um, and listen to this benediction from 1 John. In light of what we have seen and heard this morning, do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life, 
is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away, and also its lust. But the one who does the will of God lives forever. This is the word of the Lord. You're dismissed.